listening to the Ocean Rowing Podcast. I'm your host, Amanda Painter, physical therapist and owner of Strong and Empowered Rowing. I help people continue their love of rowing without aches and pains. Along the way, I decided I wanted to row across the Atlantic Ocean. I'm finding it super hard to get in touch with previous ocean rowers and find the answers on how to make this possible. So this podcast is to share my story and what I learn as I get ready for and ultimately cross the Atlantic Ocean. Hear from experts in different areas and from others who have completed ocean rows. So anyone who wants to do this has easy access and we can share our stories with the world. The worst case scenario happened and we prepared for the worst case scenario. So um, when the phone call came in and it was three o'clock in the morning, local time in the Pacific Northwest, and, uh, and I, I, you, 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 you learn to recognize what numbers are, are numbers you should answer and what numbers are numbers you can let go to, go to, to uh, voicemail because it's probably spam. And that, that was an important number and I picked it up and, and there you go. And so, and then we had 12 hours of, of four guys, basically one or more of whom could potentially be lost at sea. And, and you just don't know. Um, out at sea, it was understandable that it was scary. The boat was upside down. It wasn't coming back up as hard as they tried. All preparations, except for a couple key things, of course, with hindsight being 2020, that, that we could have done better for boat preparation. But you know, back on land, we just didn't know. So, so it was two wholly different experiences for the guys out at sea and then me back home. All right, you just heard from Greg Spooner. Uh, Greg is an amazing person. He's located here in the U.S. with me, uh, and he's also a physical therapist. So it was really cool to talk to a PT who has all, has already crossed oceans. Uh, he did the Shepherd Ocean Forest Rowing Race in 2006, which was the first transatlantic rowing race uh, across the North Atlantic. He was also done multiple independent ocean, ocean and coastal rows, which is pretty awesome. Uh, throughout, of course, I asked what his favorite foods are, and he had different answers for his different rows, which was pretty cool. Um, and also got to hear about his experience when he wasn't able to go on the ocean with his crewmates, and he helped them from land uh, handle a capsizing and almost catastrophic event. So it was really cool to hear that perspective. He gives tons of tidbits on things that he wants ocean rowers and future ocean rowers to know. Highly recommend. Uh, and he even gets really personal with us. Uh, so if you listen all the way to the end, you'll get that wonderful gem. But it is all honesty and all truth to really be able to help us ocean rowers who want to row across an ocean really be prepared. Uh, so I hope you enjoy this episode. I had a fantastic time, uh, even though there were some technology difficulties in the middle. So I apologize for that. I did my best uh, to kink that out. But uh, I really hope you enjoy this episode with Greg, and uh, here it is. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited <laughs> to be here. Um, all right, so you have done a lot of things, uh, which is awesome. So one, congratulations. Yeah, yeah, for sure. You know, I was actually thinking about this um, this morning in that Back in the day, uh, so when we were first, when or Northwest, uh, me and Jordan, Brad, and Dylan were all getting ready to row, um, there was a real paucity of, of information out there. Uh, it's not that a lot of people hadn't um, crossed an ocean, but there just wasn't a lot of information. And so, you know, we were, there was a book, I think it's called like Row Naked uh, by uh, an Australian guy who had done it, um, I think, in the 97 um, transatlantic race. And then... Mont Fontenoy had gone out and and uh, and written a book and Sally Kettle and so there there, there wasn't a lot out there but but now uh, there have been hundreds more people lots more blogs lots more opportunities to share and so um, but still I, I think there's there's always a need for more stuff so what you're doing with the, with the podcast is great so like you know if if you can't find what you need you may as well create what you need by uh, by creating this uh, this podcast this is great. Thanks. Yeah, I found it really hard to like still be able to find stuff. And since yeah. most of the people are international, just being able to connect it like mm -hmm. over the year, I think I've connected with maybe 10 or 11 people. But it's yeah. like, like you and I, like it took us months to connect and we're in the same time zone ish by an hour, right? <laughs> right, right. So it just it takes effort. <clears throat> um, so you rode in 2006, your first one, right? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, 2006 was New York to England, and it was the it was the what would be the first and only running of the. It's, it's a crazy long name, the Shepherd Ocean Fours Rowing Race 2006. I saw that. Yeah, yeah, New York to Falmouth, England. How'd it go? So you were in four, right? In a group of four. Yeah, yeah. It was a group of four of us. We had all just graduated from University of Puget Sound, go loggers uh, up in the Pacific Northwest, and um, and we actually all met. Uh, rowing, and I was the kind of the, the the old sage. By the time we we launched at 26 years old, and then we had uh, uh, let's see here, uh, yeah, Jordan was two years behind me, and then Brad and Dylan a couple years behind that. And I mean, I, I think to ask like how'd it go, <laughs> it just kind of happened. Where did we begin? <laughs> Don't worry. Yeah. Uh, more curious, like, how'd you guys, so you guys know each other from rowing at Puget Sound? Mm-hmm. Okay, that's yeah. awesome. So yeah. that's a good group. You each had at least four years of rowing experience? I know. Uh, well, I guess by the, by the time the, the row came around, absolutely. And that, that, that played a big role. But, um, you know, I came out of there with two years of rowing experience. Uh, I, I started halfway through college, and then uh, and then the other guys had had three, uh, I think, three years amongst them, possibly four. Um, and and that's actually something sort of in in the preparation for all of us that we found to be so helpful is that one, it's really good to understand rowing. And if you've uh, if you've never taken a stroke in your life, better get out there and do it, um, especially if you're going to cross an ocean, which you have plenty of experience. Um, two, regardless of how well you row, be good to make sure you row well and um, spend time understanding the differences between rowing a, uh, a single or a double or, or in an eight and then what it feels like to actually row an ocean rowboat. And case in point is if you fast forward to, to um, 2011, uh, when Adam Creek joined us, Adam is an Olympic gold medalist from Canada, um, and he joined us for a trip from West Africa, uh, Dakar, Senegal, to what should have been Miami. And, uh, and, you know, here's a guy who's been a world champion, you know, multiple times over. He put him in an ocean rowboat, and it took him a long time to figure out the difference in how to move a boat. I mean, it's, it, it really is fundamentally different. So, th- you know, th- that, that's one thing coming back to this. It's, it's helpful to learn how to row. Um, but then I, th- I think the other thing is that, uh, it's also helpful to understand that the equipment that you have in the boat um, doesn't translate to, sorry, the equipment that you have in a in a, a rowing shell doesn't translate to an ocean rowboat. Thankfully, um, and I, I feel fortunate that I, I think we, we led the charge, especially in the sliding seat category, um, you know, you're seeing less and less of the flat water rowing equipment finding its way on ocean rowboats, and that should continue to be the case because uh, some things just don't belong on salt water. <laughs> that's fair <laughs> yeah for sure <laughs> did you guys build your boat no so the boat was it was a um it was a well yes and no it was a race and it was a one design race so uh woodvale events uh which is now defunct um it was a uh, simon chock's old business uh woodvale took their woodvale pairs boat and basically took their mold and just stretched it out <sighs> to create a four person boat, which means it was super heavy, super sluggish and super rugged. Um, but you know, it made it across an ocean. And, um, and so when you pay your entry fee for the race, you get, uh, basically a raft. And then what you do with that raft above the waterline is up to you. So, yeah. yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, you pay, gosh, I think the exchange rate of, of dollars to pounds at that point was almost two to, uh, two pounds per, uh, Two dollars per pound. Um, so we were just getting hosed on entry fees, on customs fees, and all and shipping fees and this and that. And uh, but then when we got it to Seattle, where um, where we staged, the 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 beauty was is that I mean Seattle is a rowing culture. I mean if anybody's read like Boys on the Boat, that kind of gives it away. Um, you know Washington is still there. There are tons of masters clubs and junior clubs. Um, so that was really helpful to be surrounded by a by a um, an environment of rowers. But the second is if anybody's ever seen like the Deadliest Catch, um, all the you know so many of those fishing boats are are from there and so there's there's just a vast maritime culture and when it came time to outfit the boat make sure we had the electronics right all of our rowing systems right um we were in like really the perfect place where 
we, we realize, and this is, I think, real key. Um, <laughs> if we don't enlist the help of people who know way more than us, we're probably going to die. And, um, and, and la later on, one of our uh, uh, Emerald Harbor Marine, one of our uh, basically tech and shipyard sponsors, those guys were great. Uh, <laughs> Uh, apparently, after we met them for the first time and showed them our raft of a boat and told them like what we were doing, uh, um, Larry and Dan, uh, as we were walking away, like if we don't help these guys, they're gonna f and die. <laughs> That's so encouraging. <laughs> right, but you know, and and we thought, you know, it's good we didn't hear about that until maybe after we were successful crossing the ocean. Um, but uh, looking back on it, I think it was it was safe. <laughs> Sage wisdom. So, so all of you who have rode an ocean, uh, reach out and help when you can, because <laughs> we, we don't need people dying. Yeah. No, that's. Uh, so I, I want to build my boat, and I found somebody who's building it or who has built it, and either crossed or will cross. And I'm like, all right, we're talking again, like numerous times, because I'm yeah. going to learn from your mistake, and mine's going to succeed. <laughs> Where, where's your boat being uh, built? Uh, so I'm going to build it in my garage. <laughs> no way. Yep. Are, are we talking like classic uh, uh, plywood design or are you, or do you have molds that you're using and uh, vacuum kits and all that fun stuff? I think it's going to be a fiberglass top and I can't remember what the base is. Okay. Um, so I haven't actually started. So Pete Rhodes uh, mm -hmm. is building his right now and he's crossing in May. Uh, and then once he gets back, I'll start to build mine. Okay. <laughs> um, and then... Uh, Michelle Lee also built the same boat and okay. she crossed in uh, twack last year mm -hmm. uh, so and she made some adjustments that made it so it wouldn't it wouldn't cap it would if it capsized it didn't flip back over okay. so she had to fix that and I learned from her mistake on how not to do that uh, Good. <laughs> but yeah so I'm hoping to learn from them and then build it in my garage always good to learn from the people who have uh, who've uh, as we're getting ready for the first row, we, we spend enough time on, you know, on local TV and local radio and in the newspapers, and they just see our boat cruising around and being a maritime, uh, maritime environment, you know, pe people know who you are. And, um, we had spent a particularly long day at the boathouse and, or at the, at, at the boatyard and, um, people love giving advice and even if they have no idea what they're talking about. And there was a, uh, there was a pretty well-respected guy who happened to see uh, my buddy Jordan sitting at the bar, just trying to, trying to relax after a long day with a beer. And, um, and, you know, I'm realizing as I tell stories, it's going to be the second straight story where I usually drop an F-bomb. So, so we're going to be, uh, we're, Good. <laughs> we're going to be cautious here, but, uh, but this ended up being um, really important advice when we went to see in, in that, he said, you know, lots of stuff, I'm, I'm terribly paraphrasing. He said, uh, you know, lots of, uh, lots of hard stuff's going to happen when you're, when you're out there um, on the ocean. It's a completely different environment. And it's all about how you respond from your first big fuck up. And, uh, and that, would, that would be real prescient because fast forward, we are in, um, we're on the ocean and uh, our food situation could have been better. And uh, we ended up realizing we were going to have to do some pretty hard rationing to make it across the ocean. Um, and, uh, and, and this is what he was talking about because we had, we had four guys. Thankfully, we knew each other. We had rode together. We had that bond. Um, our bodies are otherwise feeling good. But there's a very serious thing happening where we are um, 16 days after leaving New York City. And we realized that we probably only have enough food for about 40 to 50 days on board uh and um you know it took us 71 days to get to the finish line <laughs> so one of those times we have to sit back and say okay we just you know let's let's try and put our emotions to rest here like be pissed off just uh, uh but talk it out and, and actually figure out how am i going to find a solution to get out of this um because the totally opposite could happen. And, and that ended up coming true again, fast forward to 20, uh, 2011 when we capsized. Um, I was gonna ask about that. Yeah, yeah, and <laughs> learn, learn from others' mistakes, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. So um, uh, that that was a big one. And, and you, 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 for most people, you say like, yeah, 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 whatever. But then when when the right person pipes in and they're saying, you know, you can, you kind of get a feel like, okay, I should probably I should probably listen to this. And and that was certainly one of those. Yeah. So is that your biggest hardship from those two races, the food and then the capsizing? Yeah, um, for, for different reasons. Uh, I'd say our, the food was one of those where, I, it's, it's strange to say this, but you know, if we had had enough food on our first row, it would have been pretty easy just because we dedicated our lives and we were at a point where we could dedicate our lives to making this happen. You know, or Northwest wasn't just a group of guys getting together to row across an ocean. Like we made this a, a nonprofit 501 C three business and, um, and we're, we're treating it like that. So we had the opportunity to live in close quarters, understand each other, um, understand our undertaking, get a lot of training rows in and, um, and, and, go to sea with with more than just the purpose of rowing across the Atlantic Ocean. Um, and so there, there was really a lot at stake. And uh, and so when it came time to to actually launch, that's when we could finally oh, just like take a deep breath and say, OK, this is why we're here. We just shoved off from the dock. You're you're like part terrified, but also part just jubilant and excited to go into the great unknown. Even though we did training rows, we'd never really been to blue water. Mm -hmm. um, so that was um, physiologically, mentally, as much as we could be. Uh, as far as the boat was concerned, everything was in place. Like we had backups. We, even though it was a race and it was going to be supported, <clears throat> we were preparing for this as though it was an independent expedition. Yeah. Um, and if something went wrong, we would be able to get out of it ourselves. Um, so I think for that reason, when we ran really low on food, uh, I mean, aside from getting, you know, I got constipated and could, couldn't, you know, drop a deuce for about a week uh, because we had poor nutrients yeah. on board during that time. Um, it, it really wasn't that bad of an expedition. So weird to say that. Uh, but then, then what's totally different is you, you fast forward to, to the row from the uh, CWF Africa to the Americas row, uh, Dakar to almost Miami. Um, that was a little different in that I had been preparing to do that row. Uh, I had graduated from physical therapy school um, and uh, was kind of doing 40 hour a week physical therapy and then as many other hours as I could find to prepare an expedition. That's tough. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, we did a, a, a training row, you could call it, even though it was kind of its own expedition, uh, rowing 750 miles around Vancouver Island, you know, getting out on the Pacific in the month of April. So it's kind of exciting. Yeah. Uh, and, um, but then just the way things worked out, I was putting my girlfriend at the time through grad school and we didn't know how long the trip was going to be. So I had to shift from being a team member to um, shore support mm -hmm. and running the expedition from land. Um, and, that was 30 hours a week, physical therapy. And then again, the rest, you know, basically staying up till two and three in the morning, managing the expedition. And, um, and where the capsize came in was that um, that's one of those things where the worst case scenario happened and we prepared for the worst case scenario. So um, when the phone call came in and it was three o'clock in the morning, local time in the Pacific Northwest, and, uh, and I, I, you, 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 you learn to recognize what numbers are, are numbers you should answer and what numbers are numbers you can let go to, go to, to uh, voicemail because there's probably spam. And that, that was an important number. And I picked it up and, and there you go. And so, and then we had 12 hours of, of four guys, basically one or more of whom could potentially be lost at sea. And, and you just don't know. Um, out at sea, it was understandable that it was scary. The boat was upside down. It wasn't coming back up as hard as they tried. All preparations, except for a couple key things, of course, with hindsight being 2020, that we could have done better for boat preparation. But you know, back on land, we just didn't know. So, so it was two wholly different experiences for the guys out at sea and then me back home. Um, it did end up being helpful to have an ocean rower, uh, a physical therapist, and... Um, you know, an experienced, uh, basically shoreside support, uh, 
in, in me back home just because that could help facilitate what would end up being the rescue of all four guys, thankfully. Uh, but it was, it was a real struggle. And it was one of those things that for, for all of us back home, um, you know, it's the kind of, it's the kind of stress, it's the kind of anxiety, it's the kind of fear that you, um, that you think about that you prepare for, but you hope never happens. And then when it does, um, it's, it's pretty miserable, um, yeah. to be honest. So, um, but you know, as, as far as the boat is concerned, as far as preparation is concerned, and like I said, the guys out at sea, I mean, everything went according to plan and, uh, and, and you couldn't have asked for a better response, uh, following a, a capsize. How did you prepare for it? Uh, up in the Northwest, we, like I said, maritime culture, there's a maritime sea safety training organization that, that we had actually paired up with, um, six or seven years prior. Uh, and they designed see, you know, ocean going, uh, survival course specifically for us, knowing the equipment that we had and knowing our, our craft, um, we would do, uh, kind of, you, you take kind of your, your standard sea safety courses. And then, and then modify them. So lots of classroom time, lots of study. Um, but then in addition to that, uh, we actually get out in, in the field. And um, so because you need to, I think before the bad stuff happens, if the bad stuff happens, hopefully not, you need to, it can't be your first time. Um, you need to know the sound of a high tension line on a cleat, you know? You need to know the sound of, and the smell of unpacking or, uh, you know, opening up the case to your, um, your, your ditch bag. You need to he know how much painter line uh, you have to pull out of your life raft until you get to the end and you get that last little pull and you hear the and then as it opens up and you smell it because if you're at sea is this working like it's supposed to i hope so <laughs> so so having that under your belt is is critical um putting your sea survival suit uh, depending on what sort of suit that you have putting that on in the water uh knowing what it's like to actually float in the water for an extended period of time uh, how to buddy up, how to get in the life raft, how to turn the life raft back over, kind of lots of the, lots of the usual stuff you do. And then uh, one of the things that we did is we actually got, uh, so we left out of a little town called Anacortes, Washington, and which is where uh, these guys are located now. Um, yeah, Q, Q3 Marine Systems, I think there. And we actually motored out way away from shore and then around another island and we dropped into just a, a lonely inlet and uh, dropped an anchor and attached a life raft to it, and then spent the next, uh, basically spent the, the day and the night in our survival suits in the life raft, um, and uh, had probably one of the most uncomfortable nights sleep I've ever had. Uh, like picture, picture a, a, a kiddie pool, like a, like a, like a small kiddie pool mm -hmm. full of kittens. Okay. Just like they're they're just they're all over each other. They're 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 everywhere, and they look so cuddly. But it's, but when it's you know how many guys did we have in there? We had five of us uh, in that in that six person life raft, and it was you know take take happy cute kittens and make us all big smelly dudes. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect image. Perfect imagery. Right. You know, and it's cold. And even though you're in your survival suit, it's cold, it's uncomfortable. You, you, you're in these big, like, like, uh, um, Vulcan mittens, you know, Vulcan sign mittens, uh, in, in these neoprene Gumby suits. And even your hands get cold, even though they're covered by Gumby. So you decide, is it safe enclosed and entrapped in here for me to pull my arm in and keep, you know, keep my hand close so I can, so I can try and just warm up my hands. And, uh, and, we capsized, we capsized the boat a bunch of times, um, you know, after that event and, and basically made it so that way nothing would be a surprise. And sure enough, if, you know, if you go back and, and chat directly with um, Jordan, with Pat, with uh, Marcus and with Adam for that particular trip, when it happened, um, everything went according to plan. 
and uh, and you couldn't have asked for a better response. The only thing that didn't go according to plan was that the boat, which always seemed to self right, um, it didn't because of a very serious lapse in design. Okay. Yeah. That's tough. Thank you for sharing. And different perspective from you being on land instead of in the boat with them. Yeah. And where that really came in handy was, and this, I mean, and maybe for, maybe for, for other folks who are going to have um, dedicated shore support, um, actually going through the training with the crew uh, who's going to be out there can be helpful. Cause what ended up happening was, is, you know, I got a call from the coast guard. We, I look online, you, you can tell that all electronics are down. You can't raise anybody via the three different ways to text or two of our SAT phone lines or even one of our data SAT phone lines. Um, and, uh, and so you can, you, from there, you can start to build a picture of what's happening on board yeah. and, and why, why things are the way they are. And then um, each rower had a PLB, a personal locator beacon affixed to their their uh pfd to their life jacket um and three signals came in in of the four and uh and so so again that just sort of starts to, that started to build what some of the potential scenarios were do i have four people still alive and only three beacons work do i have three of three people <clears throat> present is there one person and he could only find three of the beacons, you know, so, so then you can start to build your scenarios from there. And then, so that way, when you're talking with the coast guard, you can say, okay, um, here's what we know based on the information that we have. Um, when you or a passing ship can make a visual, here are the, here are a couple of the things that you are likely to see. And so that way, when word comes in, uh, that, you know, they've been spotted. And in our case, thankfully, that, that happened fairly swiftly. Um, then again, it's, it, it's not a surprise. And so you've already kind of pre-built your, your uh, response to say like, okay, so here's what we have. We have, so in our case, we had a boat turned uh, turtle and then we had the life raft uh, inflated and affixed via its painter line to, to the, the overturned boat. Um, and now meanwhile, it's like 850 miles east of Miami, so kind of far out to sea. And uh, and then because the life raft has a has a, a, a cover over it, um, they were able to make visual contact with two people. So we know for sure there are two survivors. And so based on that, here here's what we can think about preparation wise. Um, and uh, you know, in case it is just two people, but then again, two other people could have been hiding underneath the underneath the tarp, but. Um, and I think where that also comes into comes into uh, play and sort of being prepared is that whomever is on shore is going to have to make a phone call, mm -hmm. um, especially if it's a team event. You know, I had to call uh, the parents of uh, one of the guys, Pat Fleming, who uh, didn't want him to go. We're adamant about him not not going. I had to call. Um, Let's see. I had to call uh, Adam's wife. Uh, she is. They had a three-year-old, and she was seven months pregnant. Um, had to call Marcus's sister. He, they'd already lost both uh, both their parents, um, you know, by that point. And uh, and Marcus was was already somewhat of an intrepid, round the world, uh, you know, adventuring kind of guy. Uh, so in a way, she wasn't surprised. Uh, and then I had to call Jordan's parents, who are are almost as close, uh, you know, as as my parents. And and those are all really tough conversations that you have to have, especially when you don't know exactly what's going on. And then you have that story. Media is going to want to know that story that's been following you. So you need to be able to understand uh, the best way to craft that story to try and make sure that um, you wag the dog if you will. So basically you are in front of the story. You can lead it. There's not just a crazy adventurer who's out to sea doing crazy stuff going across the ocean, but actually somebody who's doing something real and something good and uh, for that has purpose and that, that you prepare for these kind of things, uh, assuming that like what happened to us, if the worst case scenario happens, the worst case scenario goes right. Yep. So 
Um, so you can kind of get a feel how <laughs> responding to a food situation and feeling super hungry for you know, a month and a half is a little different than having to respond to, uh, I guess, shore side to a capsize. And, and that's something that um, it, it's, a, it's a story that doesn't really need to be told that often, uh, except for in the right environment. And I, and I think this is one of those environments just because, um, you know, for, for you and your shore team, uh, for sure, it's, it's, it's helpful. Um, but then there are others who are listening who are going to have multiple people out there and people are doing it independently. People are doing it as part of a part of an organization. People are doing it to raise a ton of money. People are doing it to be awesome. I mean, everybody has their reasons. Um, but it still comes back to, um, it really in the end ensuring everybody comes home safe and that you can be as as talented with uh, the limited knowledge that you have in ensuring the, the 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 best outcome whether that best outcome is that um you know everybody gets home you can recover your stuff and uh and people are happy and healthy and nobody's been hurt or if on the other hand you know there's there's tragedy involved and um there, there are steps to take for each of those i mean yeah we could go on about that. <laughs> uh, I think this is a perfect place to share that. I think it's really important to know and hear, see that side and great job on how you handled it. Like that's a hard job to have. Um, yeah. I mean, you know, it's, it's not, it's not often I go like, <laughs> wait, way to go. <laughs> but you but, handled but, it the way you prepared yeah. and everything came out good. It did. Yeah. I mean, we, it, it, it's, it, a big thing 10, 15 years ago or more, maybe were the, the worst case scenario survival handbooks. And this, we, we, we kind of wrote our own and, uh, and, and yeah, thankfully we, we all survived it and everybody was happy and a little counseling later to, uh, to work through some demons and, and everything works out in the end. Yeah. yeah. So I was, uh, an EMT in college and then PT school, uh, mm. the, all those worst case scenarios, that's how my brain worked. So I remember sitting in PT school and going, but what if this happens? And my teacher at one point was like, you know, you're really morbid. <laughs> I was like, no, I'm preparing. And then it ended up, whatever it was, ended up happening like a month later. And I was like, see, this is why I asked you that question. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, for sure. Yeah. And it's, you, you, you never know. And so, so why not ask yourself those questions? Why not go to that place where you're like, that'll never happen because you just tempted fate. Yep. Mm -hmm. The more preparation mentally and physically, I think the better you can be. Um, yeah. Do you know what happened with that fourth beacon that didn't work? Yes, uh, I do. Okay. So um, the, the beacons that we used uh, were made by ACR, uh, a group out of, I think, Florida, and uh, who are amazing people, super wonderful to work with. Uh, let's see, they merged, they're now ACR Artex, but ACR is on the beacons. They're, they're one of the big players. Um, it's, it's, uh, um, the beacon itself. Um, I mean, it's, it's, it's not I'm trying to look and see if there's something I could use. Okay. So I'm a coffee cup here, right? So I guess if you, if you took, uh, probably about, probably about that wide. So not very big. It's like an old fashioned cell phone. Um, and what happens is, is when you activate the beacon, it needs to be facing the sky okay. because you're going to have two sets of satellites. You have your high earth orbit, which uh, as the, the earth spins, they're geosynchronous with the earth. So, so you have one on the Western hemisphere, one on the Eastern hemisphere, just listening for the SOS. And then you have your low earth orbit, which is closer. And there are, I think five or six of those. I can't remember, but they're actually transiting pole to pole okay. in place and then the earth spins within it. And so as the earth spins within it, they're basically slicing the earth, you know, like a, uh, like an orange and, uh, and keeping on things. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, uh, so, well, you know, so surface MRI, right. Um, and the, and so, so about every, uh, was it, it's been a while, I think maybe 90 minutes, one of those is going to pass overhead. And so um, while the high earth orbit gets your SOS and just basically, hey, there's a problem and it's tied to a particular um, beacon that's been registered, uh, which is how they know how to contact you. The low earth orbit gets your, your GPS. Okay. 
<laughs> um, for whatever reason, when first passes were made, three of the beacons were face up. One happened to be face down or just not facing the, the water, or sorry, not facing the sky. And then all that information went to, you know, got distributed to all the, the prospective agencies around the, the um, Atlantic coast uh, through, uh, throughout, you know, Canada, Newfoundland, uh, or Newfoundland, uh, U.S., and the Caribbean islands, and um, northern part of South America, which is why I was inundated with a bunch of calls from everywhere when the f shit first went, went down. Um, but uh, subsequent passings, it showed up, but for whatever reason, it was not obvious. And so as the data would come in, you know, we probably would have been a heck of a lot more comfortable had we known, but for whatever reason, it didn't. But it did allow us to be, you know, that much more on, uh, on point and on edge wondering, uh, you know, and coming up with those scenarios to, to figure out what could happen. So, um, but, you know, in, in, the heat of, in the heat of what's happening, how do you really keep track of all those details? Like, oh my gosh, I'm in the water. Stuff is everywhere. I'm really scared right now. It's kind of cold. <laughs> And you're you're thinking you're, you're you're extrapolating out. You know how long am I going to be here? Do I have enough stuff to survive? Um, you 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 may not think to look like where's where's my PLB? Is it facing the sky right now? I need to stop everything and hold it vertically. <laughs> I don't know. That might be first on my list now. <laughs> Keep an eye out just in case. You know, admit, and I, I wouldn't be surprised if the if the technology's changed. And by the way, like that's. That's probably one of the one of the least expensive insurance, like life insurance policies you could ever buy is getting yourself a, a, a personal locator beacon. So, you know, if you have one installed on your boat, if you have an e on your boat, great. OK, put one on your life jacket. Pro probably a good thing. There have been there, there have been enough people, you know, swept off boats that um, could have avoided catastrophe uh, or at least improve their, their likelihood of, of survival had they had something like that on their person. Yep. Uh, I will, I'm going to be alone. So I'm going to have yeah. anything and everything that <laughs> is necessary to hopefully be found if something happens. That's a good idea. <laughs> uh, how, how, how do you feel about, about uh, heading out there solo? Uh, so I initially I, thought I wanted to do it in a group. Mm -hmm. And then I realized that I'm an introvert and it would drive me crazy to be around a bunch of strangers who I don't know for that long. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I was like, I guess solo is the only way to go. Mm -hmm. So uh, nervous, but also excited. I think I got past the nervous point probably about five months ago. Uh, and I, so I'm planning on going December, 2022. Okay. So I've got like three years of planning. Plus I want to build a boat. So that's going to take some time and money. Um, but I, I'm excited. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What do you? How are you going to uh, keep your workouts consistent in the garage or around your uh, your boat building project? <laughs> uh, we are building a second garage. <laughs> <laughs> so it's actually a big debate right now. Uh, really so I love my gym. <laughs> uh, my husband does woodworking, uh -huh. and we just moved to Denver. So we've got an awesome garage that's basically my gym, and then we're either going to tear it down and create one giant one and have it be separated so he's got his wood shop in my gym yeah uh, or it's going to be two separate garages okay <laughs> but that is that's part of it um but he's excited to have his work workshop and with his even if it's not like a complete wood base just his knowledge of being able to build things mm -hmm. is helpful to have since i i have no idea what i'm doing no I'm, sure I'm sure there's a youtube video out there for that uh, I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> I know the old school, like, um, off the coast of Maine, like Maine is big on boat building. Yeah. But like original, like boats, not really an ocean boat. Mm -hmm. Um, my mom keeps trying, my mom's in Maine and she's like, but I can get you in a boat building course. And I'm like, yeah, it's really not the same thing. <laughs> well, y yes and no. I mean, the, the whole if, if, if you look at the hulls of some of those things, I mean, some of them are, are based off like a really classic design, you yeah. know, whatever happens up on, you know, up above the waterline. Yeah. That's, that's a bit, uh, that can be a bit different, especially if you look at the, at the, you know, at the, at the blow boats at, at the Rannox. Mm -hmm. um, but below the waterline, kind of a, there, we've, we've had 
thousands of years to try and figure out the most efficient design. Um, so, you know, Maine could be a good place to look as well as, uh, uh, you know, lots of boat building going on up in the Northwest as well with uh, um, different maritime schools and boat building schools up there. So, yep. Uh, I need to make it out to Spindrift. It's yeah. kind of, I'm planning on making it over there. Hopefully my brother's in Seattle. Uh, You've been in touch with, uh, with uh, uh, Sonia Bomstein and, and her crew at uh, Spindrift? I got in touch with somebody there about a year ago. Okay. Um, I can't remember who, but I was asking her if she had plans so that I could build one. They said no, uh, but they'll bring you out to like be able to see the boat and I can make an educated decision. Yeah. Uh, so that's all my plan. Yeah. Yeah. Sonia has done a great job turning. Uh, yeah. I, I, I don't know if she sort of set out in life to be a boat builder, <laughs> but, uh, but, you know, she, she chanced upon some, some really smart people who um, I, you know, definitely allowed her to, to learn a lot in about that side of uh, that side of ocean rowing. And I think she, she's really shined in, in developing a wonderfully rugged, um, very durable, very efficient uh, craft that, you know, for good reason, it's an expensive boat. And, uh, and you know, th th there's a real balance between cost and value. Yep. And, and I'll, I'll have to dig out this, uh, this thing somewhere, but my, you know, my grandpa, when, after he immigrated from Italy uh, to the United States back in the day, when that been about 19, uh, 1929, um, he, he opened a marble and granite shop here in San Diego. And, uh, and there was a great uh, quote up on the wall, basically talking about you know the 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 joy of a lower price will um, will long fade before uh, the happiness and comfort of of, of the best value will um, will ever will. And so so really, yeah, really really balancing how much you're uh, how much you're trying to cost cut versus mm -hmm. what's really important. It's like yeah. you know if you're going to do work on your car. Brakes are probably the place where you don't want to buy the cheap brakes, you know? Uh, anything that's going to keep you alive on an ocean rowboat, probably good to put a little money in. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I would 100, if I don't build it, I'm, I would get a spin drift. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, they, every, so I think they had quite a few boats on last year's TWAC as well. Um, but they all had no problems. They look amazing. And it seems like she's trying some different things that aren't in other models. Yeah. And I, I think that's, that's kind of cool. So, I mean, you know, Colorado is a little, a, a little dry, a little landlocked. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> what, what kind of, uh, what kind of training opportunities have you been uh, looking at or dreaming up? So there's actually Fight or Die. Um, they're based here. They're a, uh, a group that, of four that went last year. And mm -hmm. he's, I think it's him and his wife. They've made it so that there's a boat happening every year in the Talisker. Oh, great. Um, and they're based here, which is cool. So I went and saw his boat. Um, I want to say his is a spin drift as well, but mm -hmm. not entirely sure. Okay. Um, so... Basically, all I've been able to do is just rowing on a reservoir. Mm -hmm. uh, so I grew up, I rowed in high school and college, and I did the opposite as you. I rowed my first two years of college and then quit. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, I became an EMT, and that kind of took over. Mm -hmm. um, but for that, I never sculled. I mm -hmm. only did sweep. So my goal this year was I got out and learned how to scull. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, similar concepts, but it's different to have to balance it all on your own and the two oars, et cetera. Yeah. Uh, so that's kind of where I started. And then my goal is just to be able to get out, row as much as I can on the water. Um, and then once I get the boat, I have no idea. Mm -hmm. I will be talking to fight or die. I think they go south um, to like, let's see. So they go southeast. I want to say it's like Tennessee. I'm not entirely sure where they go. That doesn't make sense either. Uh, but they have an area where they kind of have an area to practice. Um, so we'll see what happens. Okay. Yeah. It's exciting. Yeah. There, there's, um, you know, going back to, to 
what I was saying earlier, the, the smell, the feel, um, you, you just can't replace that. And it, it can, it can be, the cost can be definitely prohibitive uh, and time can be prohibitive. I mean, you know, you're a physical therapist. You have, you have work to do on that, on that end too. And so uh, try, trying to get both done at the same time can be hard. And I mean, it's not unheard of at the same time for people to show up to the start line of, of the various ocean rowing races and never having pulled a day in their life at sea. And, uh, and, and they, they come across and they're successful, whether it was luck or will, or the fact that they prepared as best they could, you know, away from, uh, from the ocean. Um, I, I guess it's not technically, it's not a requisite, mm -hmm. but probably good to do it much like, you know, you can climb Mount Everest if you have enough money. Um, but you, you really get to see who spent their time preparing when, uh, when you look back at uh, ex expedition reports for the various groups. Yeah. Yeah. Now I'd love to be able to get out at least for like a week long type of thing, a few, maybe like four or five times. Mm -hmm. uh, that would be fantastic. Um, but it'll kind of depend yeah. when I actually finish the boat. <laughs> right. Well, and there's another option too, is that there are more boats in the U S that are coastal. And so if, uh, you know, if, if there's options there, you can, you can get a hold of somebody who still owns a boat and say, Hey, you plan on going out or do you still have this boat? Can we arrange something? Yeah. So for example, uh, Angela Madsen, who's just North of me up in the Long Beach area, uh, she and, um, a Phoenix based, uh, perspective ocean rower, Amir Merban, uh, they went out and rode out to Catalina and back, okay. um, you know, and that, that's while Amir is busy trying to get a boat, figure out his ocean rowing situation. He's like, well, what are, what are the resources I have? And so he called her up, uh, hopped on a plane and went for a two day row and got a chance to see what it's like to, uh, kind of always be like this and then having to row <laughs> as you're doing this. Perfect. Right. <laughs> Yep. Yeah. It, it takes that nice sort of symmetry of sculling and turns it into uh, almost a, wor uh, a vastly worse asymmetry than, than sweep rowing. <laughs> yeah. 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 And uh, imagining it, it requires a lot more upper body strength as well for the difference, the waves not being the same, hitting, missing on one side, et cetera. Whereas, I mean, you could just be on a reservoir and it's mostly legs, right? Um, but I'm imagining it takes a little bit more upper body when you're on the water. A little bit, you know, so, something worth, can, you know, we were talking about that um, flat, or, flat water equipment doesn't translate to mm -hmm. ocean rowing equipment. Yep. Like it just doesn't. Anybody, for the love of God, if, if you are watching this or listening to this, please don't put any flat water rowing equipment on your boat. Just don't. Uh, <laughs> But you know the, the rowing stroke is much the same. You got a big, heavy boat um, that carries a lot of momentum, and you, if if you row it like you row a flat water rowing boat, you're probably doing too much work. And so, for example, uh, if one of the beauties of having a GPS on board, you know, and probably five of them, depending on who you are, um, is that you have a chance to do some speed tests and you can try bodies only rowing. So you're not even using your slide. You can try quarter slide, half slide, three quarter slide, full slide, and actually get a, a, a profile of, you know, the kind of velocity that you can get utilizing those different strokes or stroke lengths. And, um, and depending on your boat, you may find that, okay, I may go faster at full slide, but how, like, how, how much is this plateauing mm -hmm. in terms of, of, you know, speed per stroke? Um, because hulls have their own hull speed, especially when propelled by oars. And, uh, and so let's say you can go 3.6 knots at half slide and 3.75 knots at full slide well how, mu how much energy does it take how much energy are you burning through day in day out to do that second half of your slide and so is that extra um, effort worth it if you extrapolate out mm -hmm. to how many days of food do you have on board 
can you uh, can you feel like you have a good stable platform to row on if you're fully compressed at full slide versus maybe just at half slide, um, especially if it's a day like this? Does it feel comfortable to go you know against BMCs rowing full slide? It may not. Um, so uh, uh, you know that that's I think one consideration. The other consideration would be is look back to you know it's, it's always good to look back and say like how's it been done in the past. Um, Wood oars are, I, th I think, a great decision because wooden oars haven't failed in a few thousand years. Um, and if you balance them right, uh, and if you get them made uh, the best way, then you, it's not that much more weight than carrying uh, a, a set of oars where, it, uh, you know, if you crack the carbon fiber, then they're done. You know, you can put a little crack in a wooden oar and you can still row with it. So, so, so oars, that's one thing. Looking back then uh, as well at, at hulls and hull design, that's another. And then uh, yet another one would be like, look, look back at the old Doryman stroke. You know, thinking about the, the old Dory, classic Dories on, on the Thames and see how it was much more of kind of a, kind of a full body, full body heave mm -hmm. as, a, as opposed to this like really streamlined legs, back, arms. Yeah. kind of a rowing stroke and going back to what you're, you're talking about about needing more upper body strength i think it, it, it's almost less that you need upper uh, more upper body strength and more that you just need to kind of understand how to hang mm -hmm. um and uh and what you may find is is that you can uh as you look for that most efficient stroke and you do your speed tests in different conditions you may find that say a half slide a bit more of a doryman style stroke is the way to go um, compared to trying to be really streamlined and taking the flat water and putting it in, in the salt water. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that was very well said. Thank you. Uh, you're welcome. See, the benefits <laughs> of talking to another physical therapist. <laughs> <laughs> Who also knows rowing. Exactly. That was yeah. awesome. I've been looking yeah. forward to this. Yeah. Um, let's see. What was my other questions for you? Okay. This is my favorite question to ask. I don't know if you'll remember that far. Uh, but did you have a favorite food on your crossing? Any of them? Uh, okay, so e each one's been a little different. We had New York to England. We went around Vancouver Island. We did my most fun expedition, which was actually circumnavigating the Olympic Peninsula in Washington State. Uh, I'm excited um, to read that. I'm gonna put that in the show notes. And then um, we only like our, we only had, I think about, half of the blog there are a couple of stories out there somewhere but yeah not unfortunately a lot of the stories lost um in written word but uh and yeah then we had uh the mid-atlantic and then we rode the length of the mississippi um and so so like each expedition has its own completely different sort of meal plan and uh and so i think each each one maybe has its, its favorites so like training rows for the first atlantic row I don't know why, but um, uh, Swedish fish were like the most amazing thing ever. Okay. Uh, the little little fish gummies, you know. Uh, and then when we were actually at sea, um, the spices that we would add to our food were actually what we enjoyed, or what I enjoyed the most. What spices? Uh, you know, you had an allspice. Uh, <laughs> you had the basic stuff like pepper. Um, had some uh, basil. Um, and we would, cause our, our base meal was either a kind of a quick cook polenta or powdered mashed potatoes or rice. And then we would add different, pretty bland. <laughs> and so, yeah, the spices would make it interesting. And, and, um, basil's really getting classy. <laughs> you know, the Italians have their stuff figured out, but, uh, I think I really enjoyed uh, um, later on. Oh yeah, when we were rowing the Mississippi, it's going to sound really gross, but we would take a tortilla, smother it in mustard, put some cheese down on it, and then we would get anchovies, and uh, and then put anchovies on the tortilla and roll it up, and um, like you know, did... sure, <laughs> a nice cold uncooked fish taco <laughs> but 
but that was just like power packed. We'd, we'd eat that. And, and after, you know, we'd already rowed from, from sun up to, to about 1 PM and we'd still have about seven more hours of rowing to go for the day. And before camping at night on shore and, uh, and because there's no stopping on that particular journey, you can't stop and take a nap like you do on the Atlantic. But, uh, yeah, all of a sudden you're just, I'm, I, you feel energized now, and you just you you preach to all these kids that you're talking to at schools along the way, like eat anchovies, they are great. And the kids are like, ah, gross. <laughs> it's awesome. <laughs> yeah, and and you know, like I, I think these expeditions are long enough too, where your palate changes, and so something that was amazing in the beginning. Mm changes and so um you end up finding a little surprise that uh was moving under the radar early on that all of a sudden is pretty damn good <laughs> by the time you know later in the expedition comes around um so therein lies an opportunity to pack yourself little surprises or have somebody else pack you a surprise and say like this is your day 20 surprise this is your day 37 surprise just kind of get some of those along the way that that replenish your uh your Justatory, is that a word? Uh, soul. It is now. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. All right. Swedish fish. Uh, I know, yeah. So, uh, as I talk to people, I mean, most people are in the UK. So, when I ask this question, it's always things I've never heard of. So, I'm sitting here like Googling what it is. So, this was really nice to be like, oh, I know what that is. Right. American treats. <laughs> But I have a whole list of things like in the UK. I'm like, okay, what is that in the US? Got it. Oh, you know what the best part was about rowing to England uh, is that so so my uh, gosh my when I eat a candy bar like one of my favorite candy bars is Twix. I uh, I always has been. Mm -hmm. It, it's like I'm still five years old when I when I see one at the store. I'm like, oh my god, can I get that? Oh yeah, of course I can. I can buy it because I'm an adult. Do you <laughs> and... sing the song when you get it? What? There's a song. Break me off a piece of the tooth. The... Oh no, it's Kit Kat. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> you know, I don't know if you're a fan of The Office, but you should search <laughs> The Office, Andy Bernard break me off a piece of that there's a whole episode as he's trying to remember what he's trying to break a piece off of <laughs> i will check that out <laughs> uh, and uh, okay so so we rode to england pretty much gave ourselves eating disorders um quite literally and uh lost a ton of weight we had no sugar on the boat for the last two weeks of of the expedition and so like your body is, is totally in, in um, like, like famine. It, it's, you're, you're in the middle of famine. So you get to shore and you eat and eat and eat and eat and eat, and eat until you're full and then until it hurts and then until you have to throw up. And you're like, oh, this is, it hurts so bad, but it's so amazing. So uh, yeah, so we're, 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 we're nearing England. We've lost a ton of weight. We haven't had sugar in two weeks and you get to England and they sell Twix bars in like packs of five. And, and like money, money is no object at that point, even though, you know, didn't have much. I was like, I could buy this and I will eat this right now. I'm going to eat all of it. And then four hours later, you're at the store and you're like, oh my God, there's more. I'm going to eat five more. And you keep doing this and it's the most amazing thing you've ever eaten. And especially like sugar tastes different. Treats taste different when you're outside of the U.S., just different materials, right? Even though it's kind of the same thing. Like an Italian Twix bar is different than a U.S. Twix bar is different than, than England. And, uh, oh, man, I ate so many of those things. So uh, I, I thought it, I, I ate so much that uh, I'd never want it again, but I still still want it. Yeah. Did you go through like a month period where you didn't want it? Um, no, actually. Okay. Yeah. So I lived in Nepal and all I had was like dalbat, so rice and beans. Yeah. And I could not eat rice for like a year. <laughs> really? <laughs> it was the one food I was like, no beans, no rice. I can't do it. That was my meal, literally every meal for two months. I mm -hmm. can't do it. So I gave up rice. I, it's, it's kind of the beauty of, of all right. So, you know, those pre-prepared meals that, that you can take with you on the ocean, like the backpackers pantry and whatnot, they, I mean, that stuff gets pricey yeah. and, and it can add up in, in a hurry. And 
uh, I guess if, if you're feeling pretty enterprising and you have a lot of time, you can really, you can use real food and create your own menu, create your own meal plan and sort of build in a little bit of that variety. Yeah. I've been like, looking, do you have any resources for that? Well, I have spreadsheet of our menu somewhere that I could, that I could dig out. Uh, that would be awesome if you're willing to share it. <laughs> Yeah, of, of course. Uh, I mean, we were super fortunate on the on our mid-Atlantic trip. We actually had a food sponsor. There was a, an organic food market that, um, which is worth looking into sponsor-wise. Uh, they covered us for uh, ten thousand dollars worth of worth of organic foods. So we had uh, different like rice and soup mixes and dried fruits and. Uh, uh, I mean, pretty much anything that could potentially make for a good ocean rowing meal, uh, brought it. And, uh, and so, so that way you could have, you know, Friday celebration meal, uh, you could have, uh, you could have, uh, different like healthy snacks along the way. Um, and, uh, and so, yeah, I, I think we had, it, it may be a little overwhelming when you see our, our menu, if I remember right, but yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll send it over to you and you're, you're welcome to post it if I can find it. And, um, thanks. Yeah, and uh, uh, I mean, no no sense hiding things. Share, share the wealth for everybody here. Uh, and uh, I started looking yeah. into there's I mean people who backpack like there's ways to make your own. I started looking into that, but I found it's there's not a lot telling you for the amount that you have to do for the calories you need for rowing. Mm -hmm. um, so. I mean, since I've, I'm just at the beginning of looking at all this, um, but they, they tell you kind of how to create it, but not really the, Hey, dehydrate it, like all the different steps yeah. that you need to go through. Um, so I found some resources, but I could always use more. Well, I mean, there, there's, there's not a lot of research to look at, you know, how many calories are burned. I think somebody 20 years ago said rowers burn five or 6,000 calories a day when they're out at sea. I mean, maybe that's true. Maybe that's bullshit. No, I don't think anybody's really done a study. Uh, you know, one of the, the article that I just posted in the rowing rehab pros, uh, Facebook group was talking about, you know, using blood tests and getting biomarkers to understand, uh, how somebody is responding to exercise and activity and are they getting nutrients? And, you know, what if you could work with, um, you know, Boulder or some performance inst Institute to say, uh, you know, we need to get some data on this. Can we, can we create this? Can we set this up? So actually you can get a, a really solid idea of, you know, if you row at whatever schedule you're going to row at, you know, start on an erg or start on, uh, on the reservoir and, and, maybe target in and, and get a sense of what sort of caloric needs you act, you, you actually have. Uh, that's a great idea. I'm very bad at reaching out to um, companies and get over it. I know I need to get better at it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, it, it's uh, it, it, it feels very transactional. Uh, and, and you also wonder, you know, is, is some gatekeeper going to see this and go like, I don't, I don't want to have to deal or bother with us. Um, I think that that's where networking comes in. That, that's where also just like having the elevator pitch ready to say, here's what I'm doing. It's going to be cool. We have an opportunity to lift both boats. You know, this isn't just me reaching out to you for my benefit. I mean, this could also benefit you. So here's some ways it could benefit you. What do you think? Is this something we could explore? Um, there was some work we did with uh, Canada's Center for Sleep and Human Performance um, out of the University of Calgary, where we wore um, some uh, accelerometer wristbands that would track our uh, sleep and wake cycles and our activity um, during rowing. And then we'd pair that up with uh, some questionnaires looking at our, at our mental fortitude and our emotional, uh, how, you know, how we're feeling emotionally and psychologically, and take that data as a means to, uh, to offer up opportunities for study. Um, on how endurance activities uh, can affect an athlete. Yeah. Um, there, was an, there was another one out of University of British Columbia and uh, where we were, their computer science group built their own program and gave us um, through. We good. 
Yes. Okay. All right. Uh, yeah. So, so they, they developed a way to, so that way um, we could keep a schedule because our electronics that we had on board would take our GPS and then calculate local time. Okay. We always had the whole way across. We were thinking of what time zone are we in? And then basing our communication, our contact and our schedule off of that. That was for, for them to would help us manage our schedule on board. For them, it was great because they could uh, develop new sort of the AI related um, programming to take known data and then extrapolate it for, for a purpose um, for them and had to write a paper out of that. Um, did you reach out to them for that? Or did, yeah. did you find that that was something they were interested in? Oh yeah, 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 for sure. Um, I was working with the University of Washington in their meteorology school um, because we needed weather reports and they had students that needed to learn how to create weather reports. Oh, nice. Yeah, so, so there, there, there was a daily weather briefing uh, in the morning and in the evening uh, based off of all the available data. Um, and then uh, what else did we do? We wanted to do some um, floating research platform, basically. Okay. And so we teamed up with University of Washington and Louisiana State with our, ocean, you know, with our oceanography departments to collect and interpret data that would help us tell a story for our education program mm -hmm. for the kids back home and would give them a very high resolution data set at pennies on the dollar compared to what it costs to, to send a research vessel out. So it's like there, there, there's, there's, always, there, there's always sort of a, a, a benefit for each. And um, it was rare that we got turned down, you know, because Rowan and Ocean's cool. <laughs> And it's crazy, and um, and if if you're doing it for more than just the sake of doing it, especially if there are some great people out there who have something you need, um, then I, I think people are going to be totally willing to reach out. And then you get to know them well enough where all these people that that we work with, they're our friends now. You know, they we the, the people at Canadian Wildlife Federation who were our title sponsors, who uh, who invested a lot of money in us. Um, their, uh, their CEO, uh, Wade Lusney, our late CEO now, um, and, uh, and Randy McLeod, uh, his, his right hand man, you know, those guys, those guys uh, were like family to us, uh, by the end. And, um, everybody who worked with us in preparing our boat in, you know, over different expeditions, they're like family. Um, the people at the universities, um, you know, we grab dinner with them now and again. And when we create our expedition reports, uh, um, you know, Fritz, uh, Fritz Starr, his, uh, you know, his, his, his wife um, takes big red markers and scribbles up our expedition reports and makes sure that, that they look good and they sound good. So, so it, you know, it, we've, I, I think if you go into it with, with a very specific purpose that's going to benefit both people and then continue the, the relationship like a relationship, like they're, like they're going to be your, your friends and confidants, I think that goes a really long ways. And, and it takes the sort of, you know, introvert versus extrovert challenge and it can really kind of throw it out the throw it out the window because you're making friends yeah. uh, along the way as you do it and uh and you really find i think an immense value in creating a network of people that are are so interesting and have uh, really amazing stories of their own that that they can tell um and uh and and so uh it, it's hard at first it really is. But then you really, I think, find your stride. Thank you. Yeah. That's, uh, that's very helpful. My plan is, I think it's going to take me, I'm, I'm planning like worst case. So 60 to like 110 days is my guess. It's a nice window. You can, uh, <laughs> is that within two standard deviations under the, the bell curve somewhere in there? Somewhere in there. Yeah. And then as I'm reading the books, uh, I can't remember which one I just read. Um, I'm not very good at reading books. I'm good at reading like shorter things. Mm -hmm. And one of them I read was she was trying to cross in, get it under a hundred days and ended up taking like 115 or 120 or something. I'm like, oh man, like I was capping at a hundred. I need to plan for this. <laughs> yeah. You, you never know, right? Yeah.
but it's really cool now being able to read everyone's stories. I think the biggest thing is just no one's talking about how to get ready for it. And mm -hmm. when they do talk about the worst case scenario, uh, there was one book that was really helpful. I talked about it in my last podcast, I think. Um, I can't remember which one. It was the first one I read and they actually talked about their capsize and how he planned for it. And just like knowing all of those things, like you talked about, just planning for it, being ready and prepared for it and knowing the possibilities and reading that one is kind of what started this where I was like, I want to hear about all the worst case so that I can learn from it. Yeah. Like, how can I prepare if I've never done it? How can I learn from people who have been through it? But that, yeah. that's kind of the stem for what happened with starting this actually. <laughs> Did you ever think about being constipated at sea and not, not being able to take a dump and, and what the implications of that are? Uh, I haven't, but I've definitely had that issue on land. So, <laughs> yeah, it's 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 not it's not pleasant, and uh, you know we're we're probably far enough in here where only only the, you know only the diehards may be watching, unless you do some like best of features for your conversation. <laughs> but uh, but um, so at sea, we you know on our first trip we didn't have the nutrients uh, on board to to keep our keep our our uh, our bowel movements you know happy and healthy it was kind of one of those things where when you had to go you didn't wait you're like you say you i'm off the oars or you're jumping out of the cabin sitting on the bucket looking into the eyes of your best bud you know <laughs> as you as you go and um and you take a big deep breath there it is. Yes, we are going. Okay. And you just try and get that thing out because otherwise it's going to stick around. And, um, but at a certain point that didn't happen. And, and I had two incidents uh, throughout the, throughout the journey where um, one was, I think about four or five days. Another one was almost a week and a half, if I remember right. And, uh, and, and culminating in, um, you know, a bit of invasive work and also four hours on the bucket. So, uh, and we, we have medical support back on shore and you talk, you talk to medical support and you're like, okay, I'm getting a little distended, you know, like my, my belly's starting to grow a little bit, you know, in, in a way I'm not accustomed to what's going on here. And, uh, is this bad? Is this toxic? Well, after a while it can be toxic. So, so knowing sort of how, how long you can be prepared. So that's where some medical training can come in, come into play, or at least reading up. And then, um, and then what you can do with the, the equipment that you have on board to try and, and write the ship. Uh, so if you get, if you get stuck, you got to come at it from both ends, you, you know, whatever, whatever you can consume to, to liquefy all the, all the, the, the junk in your, in, in your large intestine, uh, and then going in from the other end and seeing, you know, can I do this with a suppository? Can, do I need to, um, what did I end up doing? Oh yeah. So, so two, two ways got me going. One was the hook. Okay. And then, uh, which was very unpleasant, but you got to do what you got to do. The second was to actually, um, stimulate the, the small intestine, stimulate the bowel to actually start moving is, is you had to kind of, you had to irritate the, the lining and piss it off. And so, um, with the, the tools we had left on board, I had a small syringe, um, and a, and fresh water and dish soap and so made like a solution of dish soap that uh that you just in, inject up there and again not pleasant but you got to do what you got to do and uh and then go sit on the bucket and you can you can feel like you can feel things are churning and like oh something's up i, I did something right and <laughs> And, uh, and then you, and you, you, you settle in for, for a while on the bucket and, and hope it all, hope it all works. Um, but, uh, yeah, if you can avoid that, that would be, that would be good. <laughs> uh, thank you for the real talk. I love it. <laughs> God, it's gotta happen. There are no secrets. Um, why did you have a syringe? Uh, for, for flushing, uh, wounds. Mm, gotcha. Yeah. So, okay. you know, so you could, you could throw a saline solution, um, yeah. over a wound if that happened which we we had a couple gashes on board but yeah medical kit was was full of uh different suture kits syringes uh a whole medical cabinet that um that uh we actually had a hard time getting rid of uh after our, our first row just because you don't want to throw that stuff away mm -hmm. um so was, we had to find a place to actually drop it off to get it processed yeah. uh yeah yeah awesome yeah
Well, I don't want to keep you much longer. You've spent so much time chatting with me. So thank you. It's been a good time. I hope we, uh, I hope we have some gems in there. Yes, absolutely. I, if you heard me or saw me taking little notes, I was marking times. And that's yeah. where I go back to get my little clips for the beginning. Uh, <laughs> so there's tons of them. I think I have four timestamps here. Um, are there any other tips that you would want to leave uh, future ocean rovers with? Uh, yeah, I, I think a few things. First off, read Rowing into the Sun. And that, uh, uh, that, that's a book written by my teammate, Jordan Hansen. And he does, a, he, he, he's actually a, a writer, so he, he's good at it. And it's not one of those books where uh, it's just self-aggrandizing and, and saying, you know, look what I did. This was an amazing adventure. We kicked ass. It was great. Uh, we conquered the ocean. No, it, it was actually, um, it was a, a, a great juxtaposition of preparations with the journey itself. So it's, it's kind of hopping back and forth. And he develops the four of us as characters. And then also the boat as a character, because it is. It was named after his late father. And, um, and so it, it details actually a lot about preparation and the experience and how you feel about it as you sort of process uh, getting ready to go to sea. And then some, you know, a little bit about life at sea. So uh, a very, very well-written book that is, uh, is worth, uh, worth picking up. Uh, that, would, that, would be, that would be one thing. Um, I, I think another one in terms of preparation is um, mindset and understanding that this is a really big deal. And, uh, and there, there's a lot of gravity behind what you're doing. You know, you're putting yourself in an environment where you, you may not come home. Um, and so uh, when when people try and paint this as, you know, I'm going to go break a record, I'm going to conquer the ocean, I'm going to, um, you know, it's just, this is might over, over nature. I, I think that's, uh, that, that, that's, that sets you up, I think, potentially for, for a dangerous um, mixture of, of maybe being a little more ill-prepared than, than you thought you would. So, so I, I think taking some time to really understand what you're getting yourself into is, is important because if you made the decision like, I'm gonna row across the ocean, you just came up with it one day, uh, and, then, and then you go do it. Um, I mean, that, that's great, but it, I, I think it would be appropriate to, to really sit back and take some more time to, to understand your, your reason behind it um, because it's, uh, it, it's not just you that goes to sea. It's your family. It's your loved ones. It's it's the people who are your your friends and your fans, and uh, and you're, you're you're taking them along for the ride too. And so um, it, you you can't be cavalier about about doing this, um, especially because you know that it's all about how you respond from your first big fuck up, right? Uh, and and that's going to happen no matter what. And, and there's, there's going to be a, a real truth that, that you find yourself encountering when you're out at sea and you're alone, um, or even for those who are, who are with a team. So, uh, so I, I think that's, that's important, um, vitally important. And, uh, and there's, there's a certain amount of honesty in being honest with yourself about what your intentions are. Um, in, in doing it. Uh, there, there's always thrill. There's always getting out to, to see what, what's going on. But, um, you know, how can you take something like this and, and, and make it something for a greater purpose? It doesn't have to be like a grand, great purpose, but, but something small because there's, there are going to be days that really, really suck out there. I mean, it's, it's just the case. You, you may hit your emotional uh, lowest point in your lifetime out there. Um, and you may hit your emotional high. And, but especially on those, those, those days where it's a slog, uh, uh, having purpose is important and, and accepting what you've put yourself into the situation that you're in and finding the way to appreciate where you're at, at your lowest point is, uh, I, I think something that you, you can't prepare enough for and, but, but putting yourself in the headspace to encounter that, um, will be, uh, will, will be a, a great opportunity for your, your mental and emotional survival on, 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 on the, the, the harder days, you know, nature's taken a lot of people, nature consistently 
no matter how much in human ingenuity tries to uh, beat it. You know, nature wins. And, um, and so it's, it's our responsibility as those, you know, transiting for a short time on the ocean to think of nature as your, as your partner. And, uh, and so, you know, submitting to the forces of nature, um, being patient with nature and what she throws at you and, uh, and appreciating those little successes that you get along the way. So I think that's it. That is perfectly stated. Uh, yeah, I'm, 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 I'm excited to continue to follow your, uh, your, your preparation and, um, and yeah, and, and also excited to see what, uh, I guess, what's in store in terms of, of that, that message that you can craft, whether it continues to be, you know, uh, or how it shifts between a person, you know, your own personal message uh, or something that, that fulfills the, the greater purpose. I think e either way, it's, um, you know, it sounds like you're in the right headspace. And, uh, and because you're surrounding yourself with people who, who have done this, um, yeah, you, you, you couldn't be putting yourself in, in a better position, I think. So um, yeah, keep, keep it up. I'm excited to, to see where this goes. Thanks. And thank you again for being on the podcast. I really appreciate it. Uh, we'll keep chatting um, and let me know if you've got any questions or if I can ever help you with anything. Um, I know we're talking from the physical therapy perspective as well, but let me know if there's anything I can ever do for you. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. It's been fun. All right. Bye. Bye. All right. Well, I really hope you enjoyed that episode with Greg. Uh, so I learned a lot. I had a blast recording it with him. Uh, if you liked, please hit that subscribe button. You can also find us on YouTube or if you have ideas on people you might want on the podcast or if you want to be on the podcast, uh, whether you're an ocean rower who's already done it or you're looking to be one, I would love to hear from you. Mail at oceanrowingpodcast.com or you can just go to oceanrowingpodcast.com and there's a link to email me. Uh, but I'd love to hear from you. Hit that subscribe button. Uh, and I look forward to the next episode, which will be another um, update episode from me on where I am at in my training. Now that it's 2020, uh, I moved a little bit further along in my training program and in my process. Uh, so I'm going to share that with you where I'm at in that next episode. And I hope you enjoyed listening. Thanks. Thanks.